Yes. So hello, everyone. My name is Tajuddin, and I'm the call host for today. I have Pradeep, who is the call facilitator, and she will also be helping with the call today. Um, today's session is a skill obsession on tooling, and it's basically open source software in practice. What that means is that we are going to look at some of the software practices that help you to achieve your open source uh, projects. That is good coding practices, something about code review, and finally, we are going to look at package management. So if you have used um, maybe R or Python, you will see that they have different packages. So how do you make or how do you manage such packages? So as usual, this call and every other call, we have the code of conduct of OLS that applies to it. And if you experience or witness any unacceptable behavior, you can report that by sending an email to teams at weareols.org, or you can report the issues to individual organizers that is Berenice, Malvika, you or myself at weareols.com at um dot org. As and as I have mentioned, this call is going to be recorded. Then speaking French room, and if Taz looks like uh, we lost you. Yeah, I was going to say the same. I was even thinking maybe it's my computer. Uh, Taz, I think we lost you for a couple of seconds. You're stuck. Okay, I think I'm back now. Yep, clear for me. Okay, yes. Um, so I was talking about the breakout rooms. Um, kindly edit your name to reflect that. With that, I'm going to start a presentation that shows us where we are in the call. I hope you can see my screen. So this is a skill obsession and it's tooling for color um open <clears throat> collaboration and we are looking at soft op open source software in practice. We are currently in week nine of the cohort, and this week we also have the mentor mentee call. This week um we are looking at the tooling and this is the aim, um applying good coding practices to your software thinking about how you review your code for yourself and for others, and also identifying package management for your project. We're going to have three call, three um, code presentations today, good coding practices, code review, and then finally package management. If you click at the link, you'll see a link to other videos from previous sessions. So with that, I'm going to call on Olighton, who would present good coding practices for us and over to you all right so thank you very much for inviting me here i'm going to try to share my screen i hope that this works let me see see my screen is paused okay So share. I think it's coming up. Okay. I see resume. I don't know if that works. Um I'm just in black screen showing that coming up. 
anyone able to see a light on the screen? No, no it's still the black screen. Black screen. Why this is? Even if I unshare and then try to reshare. Let me try making you co-host if that would help somehow. Okay. Maybe if you try sharing oh, again. Okay, let me stop sharing. If it doesn't work, I think I'm probably going to reboot the computer to see if that will solve the problem. Okay, so if Bastian, it's okay to go first. Maybe you can restart the computer. Yeah, I can try. <laughs> okay. Please try. Let me see if that works from my end. Share window. Let's see. So, can you see my screen? Um, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Then I would be happy to get started if you want. <laughs> yes, please. I think so. Um, is trying to restart his system. Okay. Then, hey everyone, I'm. Bastian and I will talk a bit today about code review and how it can help you improve your code quality. And I want to give you a brief intro about myself first, why I'm today talking to you and my background. So I'm interested in all things open, that's including open source software, which is part of the reason why I'm here. That's open science, and that's also open participation or citizen science. And I've worked at this intersection for, for many years in different ways. So one of the things I've done a couple of years ago was starting a project called OpenSNP, which if you are into biology things you might have heard about, which is like a large open database of human genetic data that is crowdsourced. So it brings together open participation, crowdsourcing data with open science principles. The data is donated in the public domain. And of course, it's written in open source software and it's like out there for other people to reuse. So as I said, it brings these like interests together. And like since then, I have done many different open science, citizen science things over the years. And this, of course, includes also code review in different forms. So code review, it can be a bit of a quite abstract idea, maybe so like to get started, I like so have like a working definition. I did what every good researcher does, go to Wikipedia and see what Wikipedia says, code review says, and see if I agree or disagree. And the Wikipedia blurb says code review also can be referred to as peer review. It's a software quality assurance activity in which one or more people check a program by reviewing and reading parts of the source code. And that's broadly speaking, indeed the case. So like the big thing why we do code review and look at our code and have other people look at our code is to improve software quality and make sure our software works in the best way and the way we think it should work. But in a way, it actually fits in into other ways of quality measures and improving quality. And one that you might already have heard about or already do yourself is testing. That's unit testing, integration testing, which really has the goal of understanding, does the code I provide do what I think it does and what I think it should be doing. And the nice thing is by writing tests, you write more code to test your code and you can see if it actually gives you the results that you think. And the nice thing is it's automatable. So if you do continuous integration and continuous deployment, like it can automatically test your code and tell you whether it works or not. So it's very nice and very efficient once you've written the tests. 
then there is linting or code formatting, which is maybe like even a bit further away from the code, which really just checks, does my code follow this style? Does it look like we agree in our research project or in our open source project that our code should be written? And you can think of it as like a spell check and grammar check for your code, which doesn't tell you anything about whether it actually makes sense, but it tells you whether it looks correctly like a code sentence should look like. And again, that's automatable. And now lastly, then code review goes into more detail even, which says like, does my code actually solve what I wanted to do? Even if like it's completely correctly formatted, the testing is all like everything passes all the automatable check, but does it do it in the right or best way? And that's something a computer in a sense cannot answer. That's a task where humans are needed to like review things and like talk to each other and think, is there maybe a better way to solve this problem? How should we do it? So the idea that like code review can help with is identify potential improvements. Like, did you write your code in a way that it's as fast as it could be or as efficient as it could be? It also can help to actually clarify the code. It's like, is it documented well enough? Is the code com commented enough to actually make any sense for other people? Can other people that have not written the code this can be either you and three months from now when you don't remember how you actually wrote a code or of course anyone else, can they make sense of it as well? And also it can see whether it adheres to some best practices in the code structure, for example, avoiding repetitions and problems like this. So it's a quite open-ended task and it can be as involved or uninvolved as you as the code review team agree it should be. So how do you do the reviewing in practice? and? There's many different ways, as I said, that you could be doing it. And that's why the answer is it depends. So it depends on how your project wants to do code review and what your particular objectives are. And if you want to review for like another project, you should see what are the norms of the project, are there guidelines for how to review and how they want to review it. And lastly, of course, what's your own role in the project, which can be quite different. And so looking at the first two of these, there's like two examples I want to highlight here where we can see where like these norms and guidelines are really well structured. And the first one is the uh, our OpenSci uh, packages. Like our OpenSci is this collection of peer reviewed and like good like our software packages has like a whole guideline on how to develop, maintain and review packages for our OpenSci. And you can go to devguide.roopensci.org and they will give you a long list of like the things you can do. And they even have like a really nice little uh, PDF that you can download and like read. And one important thing that they say in starting off is like the first thing is like when you review code, it's a human activity. So other people are involved in it as well. So you should actually make sure to follow the code of conduct. So as we've heard at the beginning of this talk, uh, of this uh, session here, it's really important to like set these expectations of having an inclusive, welcoming and harassment free experience also in reviewing code. And in a bit, we will hear a bit more about that aspect as well. And then this like it goes into all the details of like how to actually review code. Similarly, if you are a Python person and not an R person, the Py OpenSci people have like very similarly a guide for reviewers. And they also beyond again it's talking about of code of conduct, it's very important, have like a template. And they say these are the things you should be checking if you are a peer reviewer that like make sure that the code is documented and works and is designed in the best possible way for being a Python package in this case. And also the nice thing is if you want to actually submit something to Py OpenSci, you can read the same guidelines and see what people expect of you as someone writing code. So it works in both directions as well to say, I, I look at this from the other side. And of course, our OpenSci and Py OpenSci are really, really big open research library projects, which are large ecosystems. And one particular difference to maybe your own projects is that in these, the reviewers are typically not necessarily contributors or even the end users of the things they review. So you get someone who's very skilled in the programming language of choice and how to make best software packages, but they might not be an expert necessarily in what you are trying to achieve. So it's like, maybe a bit review, removed from like your own interests and goals. So that brings us to the question, how to implement code review for your own so far 
hopefully only so far but like growing smaller project that you want to grow out to something bigger and this brings us to the aspect that the wikipedia introduction didn't really talk about which is that code review has a big social function it's about like improving the quality of our code and making sure our code is efficient and readable and so on but there's extra dimensions to this as well the social aspects include actually as, as i said it's by design about the human factor and this actually means we it allows for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer if we are collectively i submit a patch to your open source software package and i re and you review it we both hopefully learn from each other you see what i was thinking about the, writing the code what i tried to achieve and maybe i made it in a way that you have never seen and you learn how to actually like implement things and the other way around if i did something wrong and you give me feedback this allows me to grow and learn about about programming in this language and also it can increase the sense of mutual responsibility because now it's not just this abstract code thing which no one cares about but you know that like there are other people that will read this and will give you feedback. So it's like actually a shared responsibility, our open source software package, and it's not on like the maintainers. It's like a collective thing. And this brings us to the thing that code review can often feel quite combative, let's say. And if you are an academic, you might have heard of reviewer too, which like typically you have multiple peer reviewers and one is always very horrible, gives very negative feedback and thinks they know everything about everything. That's reviewer two, two. And they see this as a competition. It's like they are having the one truth source of knowledge and know it the best. Don't be like this if you are doing code review in your project. This is not why we are doing code review. It's not about being right. Because if it's really having a right answer, then you could automate it. If you have like a right answer for what your program should do, you write a test. If you have like a right answer of how it should look like, you can automate it. You don't need to argue with people. You can just like set this aside. Code review is to actually improve things collaboratively and collectively. So instead, be reviewer one. Reviewer one sees reviewing as an asynchronous collaboration or asynchronous pair programming. It's really working together, even if you are not sitting on a Zoom call at the same time, but to learn from each other and mutually improve the thing you are wanting to work on together. So that's that's really important. And for doing this as a collaboration, it's important to set expectations. What do you want people to focus on when reviewing? If you already have like automated linting in place, don't give people a hard time for like how the code looks like because this will be automated away. And if you say like you don't want to focus on like particular parts, that's fine as well. Just be sure that everyone knows what the expectation is of what reviewers can reasonably give feedback on and what they can't, and also that people learn from each other. And of course, be kind but when interacting with each other. Because as I said, code review can be a quite daunting task, especially if you are a newcomer, both to reviewing, but also being reviewed, which is why actually there is like a, like by now starting to be studied to like the thing that's called code review anxiety, that people are really anxious about being reviewed and getting their code reviewed, but also actually being a reviewer because it's also a daunting task to give feedback in a positive way, in the way that people learn from it and that you are being understood in the right way. It's a communication problem that weighs on both parties in a way. So it's something if you are really interested, you can read on a bit more. And if you think that you like are anxious about doing code review, there's actually a workbook written by psychologists to actually help you understand why maybe you don't need to be that afraid or how to handle with the anxiety you're experiencing to minimize the impact. So just I want to acknowledge that like it's easy to say we should all having these positive interactions, but for some people it's really, really hard to engage with peer review because they're very anxious about it and have these like strong anxiety. So then beyond being kind, trying to avoid people getting anxious, as I said, it's not about knowing the one true answer. It's about working together, which means effectively also you as a reviewer don't necessarily know the true answer. So no one knows anything. Thank goodness. I'm so relieved. I thought it was just me. So ask questions as a reviewer. Maybe people made something that looks weird to you as the reviewer ask instead of saying this is wrong like ask what people were thinking offer suggestions but have like an open mind that also you as the reviewer are not necessarily the one source of truth 
And lastly, then it's about doing iterative reviews. If you've ever written a manuscript and gotten feedback from a supervisor or anywhere where you need to like share writing, you might have gotten feedback where people gave you feedback looking like on the right, everything was marked up in red and like people like in the nitty gritty, whether the grammar is wrong or spelling only to then in a later iteration, the whole thing is being thrown out because maybe the whole paragraph didn't make sense. So you spent a lot of time refining a paragraph, which at the end was never in final, final text you published. So start with the big top level things and only then move down to the details. First, think about is this the best way to structure the code to actually solve the problem that we are trying to solve before then optimizing in the smaller details to avoid this duplication or waste of effort where people spend a lot of time on doing this. And that's basically it for the, the code review bit. There's a couple of links to the different guidelines which you can use if you want to contribute to our OpenSci or PyOpenSci, but also of course learn from for your own projects. I put in the links to the, the papers as well. And yeah, I'm happy to do a QA. and a And I, of course, will share the slides in the, the notes document so that you have all of those available. So thanks. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I, I hope I'm audible. OK. Um, yes, so um, after your presentation, I think it's right to take um, a couple of questions from the participants. So if anyone has a question, you might unmute and say the question out or write in the chat or in the notes. So if you scroll to line 184, 185, we have questions for the first um, talk, which is code review. Um, so if you have any question, also you can write it in the chat here or unmute to ask your question. Or comment. Uh, thank you, Islam. Sometimes it, it takes a moment for people to process the, their questions and yes. Um, so Jackie mentioned that it was a great presentation and they are going to try to implement in their lab. That's really great. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Faisal that is documentation a part of the review process? Yeah, I think it definitely can be. As I said, it depends a bit on the, the expectations you set for your review. But typically, ideally, let's say in the ideal world, if you like make a change to your software, someone makes a pull request and wants to merge something that adds something new that's not covered by the documentation, then this should include the documentation for the new feature that's being added, which then is part of the review to make sure that the the part is that both things are up to date in the same way that like the documentation covers the current state of the, the software and vice versa. So that should definitely be part. I would say the only difference maybe would be if you have like pull requests, which are small bug fixes, mostly where it's about are these bugs actually fixed and does it behave like the documentation <laughs> already said it would be working. In that case, maybe there is no documentation change uh, that is necessary. And I see there's another question in the chat, which I can read out, which is, are there any training sessions organized in the R Python communities available for how to code review? 
That's a very good question. I'm on the top of my head not aware of any structured structured trainings for this being organized. But it would be really amazing if someone did this. I think as long as you don't have this, what can be really helpful is doing a like pair code review, similar to how many researchers learn academic peer review as well, which is like as a student, you do a review together with your supervisor or someone more senior, and you can compare notes and see how someone may be more experienced, what they are picking up on and how they are implementing the review. So that's one way if you want to do it and learn it like with someone who's already done a couple of more, especially on the project. I would say the other benefit of working in the open is that you can go back and read all the peer reviews done for any of the software projects in, for example, our OpenSci and PyOpenSci. So you can see how the communications actually evolve over time there without having done it. But so you can learn a lot from looking at what other people have done in the past already right now. That is another easy way if you don't have anyone accessible right now. Um, thank you. We have a question from Alfredo. Thank you, Tash. Uh, okay, thank you, Bastian, for, for the very clear presentation. Uh, I'm a very novice programmer, so I have, maybe this is a very general question. So you mentioned that the testing of the code can be automated, and that's something we, we assume that before putting the, the code into availability to the public, the testing has already been performed and it passed okay. So afterwards, you may subject the code to code review. And so which would be in terms of the objective of making or improving the code, the difference between testing and reviewing, because you're already reviewing a code that has already passed the testing. So it, it already makes the things it is meant to do. So the, the, the reviewing is not for the sake of uh, confirming that it does the, the actions it, it makes. So which is the objective of, of code review and making it more efficient, which would be the, the, the general principle? Thank you for the answer. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really great question. So I think there's two aspects. One, of course, is the, the tests don't come out of thin air. They don't appear for your code. So actually the tests themselves are being reviewed as well to make sure they actually are like test the things you want to test and like are appropriate for ensuring the tests actually test yeah, the right thing. The other thing is, I think, as you said, like efficiency is like a big part, like there are, like for every single coding problem, there's thousands of different ways how to solve it, some more efficient than others. So there might be like an improvement to efficiency, to speed of the code, things like this, but also to, to readability, to like, does the code like, is it easy for others to read? Does it maybe have some things which tests cannot pick, like I, like nothing comes to mind, but like security issues might be one depending on the software you are writing where technically like it works, the tests all pass, but maybe you should not save the passwords in plain text in the database, like whatever it is, things like this where like it's the, the human eye can pick it up a lot more easily than like testing that hasn't been written yet. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bastian, that's good. Um, thank you very much, Bastian, for the presentation. Um, if we have any questions for Bastian, kindly add them in the chat or in the notes. Um, and I think if Bastian is still here, he might be able to answer them. Um, we are going to move to the next presentation from Alighton. I hope your system still works. Yes, let me yes. try to okay. share my screen now. Sure, please. Are you able to see my PowerPoint screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, that's good. All right. Okay, so I can go on, right? Yes, please. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, once again, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Alay Tawe, and I... I'm currently the training officer for the African Society for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, where we do some uh, pipeline development when we uh, organize 
Vodathons and work on projects. So I'll be talking from that perspective, even though I also am um, into scientific uh, computing. So there are other code related things that I do uh, in my day job. But then I'll just talk generally about uh, writing good code. So I have some, some things that I've put down. So I'll get into that. I don't know if my slides are advancing, so let me see. Okay, good. So my definition of a good quality code is code that is readable, easy to maintain, and others can extend or build upon the code. And I have a few attributes that I've noted down for that. So the code should be maintainable, it should be testable, it should be portable, reusable, readable, scalable, robust and adaptive, adaptable over time and also reliable. So let me get into the maintainability of code. So good quality code should be maintainable, meaning that it should be easy to test. You should be able to find bugs and fix them for every developer working on the code base. So you shouldn't be the only one who is able to actually debug the code or even fix things in the code. It should be whoever gets a hold on the code and tries to find bugs, they should be able to do that without your involvement. So that way um, the code can be maintained. So another thing about good quality code is being testable, right? So you have to be able to use different scenarios to test your code thoroughly. Ideally, you want to start the code development on a development um, server, for instance. And once you feel that the software is at a stage where you want to start to test the features, then you move the code into a test um, server and run the test. You could do unit tests, you could do different types of tests. And when everything seems satisfactory in terms of how the code um, should work, then you move it to the prod machine where uh, it's being used live to do whatever uh, the software is supposed to do. So testing ensures that broken code does not find its way into the production stage. Then good quality code is code that is portable. So functions should typically not get too long. Otherwise you should break down the functions into smaller functions or create new functions. So that way um, the code is portable. You don't want to have like a giant set of several lines for just one function. And then it's hard to, um, it's hard to understand in some cases, or when you're trying to fix errors, it's just um, hard to debug. So code is, good quality code should be reusable. And I will branch from reusability into reproducibility shortly. So um, do not repeat yourself. So if a part of your code does the same thing in more than two places, you should turn it into a function and then it's easier to combine these functions into libraries, or if you're building um, pipelines like bioinformatics pipelines, you could combine these functions or methods into sub workflows that do a particular, maybe set of tasks similar across your um, types of analysis. So you might have um, functions or methods that you moved into a sub workflow that could do three or maybe two or three steps common to maybe your RNA-seq analysis if you're doing bioinformatics and also common to things like maybe variant calling or some other type of analysis, then you have those as what we call sub workflows or in the general uh, computing terms, libraries. So it's reusability is very important. Okay, now I would get more into reproducibility, okay? Uh, and I will talk more specifically about working with biomedical um data you know like omic sequences 
could be genomic data, metagenomic data, or RNA seq data, things like that. The idea of building a reproducible pipeline is you collect your data and then you write code to do some type of analysis on the data. So which is basically what we call pipeline development. And when you do run the pipeline against your data sets, you should generate some outputs, which you can then interpret in order to advance the knowledge of biology and health. Uh, reproducible pipelines have been made easier with the um, with the evolution of frameworks like Nextflow and SnakeMake that make writing of pipelines easier so that somebody that doesn't have the nitty gritty knowledge of things like Python or Bash or whatever language you use can use these workflow engines to run their, to run your pipeline and generate the same results that you have generated from your end. So I'll talk about the workflow management systems that enable reproducible coding. Um, we have a number of them. Uh, one of them is Nextflow. Nextflow is a workflow engine that enables interoperability. So you can run code uh, in different computing environments. For instance, you can run it on your high performance computing cluster, your local machine, in the cloud, maybe Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud, and you get the same result. You write the uh, pipeline. Sorry, Olayton, are we supposed yeah. to be seeing second slide? No, I thought I was advancing to the other slide. Okay. We see the second slide yeah. yet. Oh, yeah, still seeing the second slide. Okay. So which slide are you seeing now? Uh, fourth. Oh, I see. Okay. So that means it's... Okay. So that means it was showing a different... Uh... Okay. I think I would probably just advance it from... The sidebar. Yes, please. Okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know whether I should recap some of the things I've said, or I should just move to the workflow engines part. Okay, I can just go quickly on this. So I talked about maintainability of code, which essentially means every developer working on the code base should be able to find bugs easily and test. Then I talked about you, when you're doing your um, code development, you want to start working on the dev server, then you move the code to the test stage where you do um, all your tests and once all the tests pass and you think you're ready to go and you go live by moving the code to the production server for uh, you know your users to be able to actually uh, use the service or the code. Then I talked about portability of code and breaking down of functions uh, and not just have one huge giant function. And I talked about code being reusable, meaning that you don't want to repeat yourself if you're if a part of your code does the same thing in more than two places, just turn it into a function, and then you could combine these functions into libraries or sub workflows. Then I went into uh, reproducible uh, pipeline development using bioinformatics as a case study. Then I started to talk about the workflow engines. Then I talked about Nextflow as a workflow engine that enables interoperability, uh, component reuse. You could resume workflows from the last successful um, step. So that's what I mean by reentrancy. Of course, you could parallelize your um, workflows by using multiple threads or different uh, number of CPU cores and use of you know software containers and things are also enabled there. So it makes reproducibility easier. And these features also apply to other workflow engines like SnakeMake. I'm not super um, fluent in coding with Galaxy. I do know some Widow and um, CWL, and I know that these workflow engines typically have these features generally. But the idea is just that uh, running of pipelines is more reproducible when you use uh, workflow frameworks like this. As against writing the code in just raw implementation, like maybe Bash or Perl, that might make reproducibility more difficult. Okay, something I would like to emphasize is to write your open source code and publish it in a findable repository like GitHub. So 
typically I do encourage having a readme in the GitHub repository that describes what that um, tool that you've developed is actually going to be doing, the justification, and just any user can pick up that GitHub repository and the readme and understand the objectives and what you had in mind. And of course, things like how to install and other information can be there. So you could break down the GitHub repository into different directories with maybe some for scripts, documentation, you know, even if you have figures as case study figures that people could look at, you could have those things there as well. They are working with bioinformatics for sure. You want to have a directory there that captures the accessions that um, you used in testing the, the pipeline. But because of time, I'm just going to move on. So typically, uh, you know, this is emphasis is here on open science. We want to improve the accessibility, quality, and the efficiency of science. So if you have any um, outputs like manuscripts coming from, uh, you know, using your code against certain data sets, you want to ensure that these are open access so that people anywhere can actually read the article and you know uh, having your code and data and pipelines as findable accessible interoperable and reusable is very good documentation is very important you know good comments uh, in your code so good quality code should be readable right you want to ensure that the code can be understood by programming newbies and developers use consistent and descriptive naming conventions for objects for functions and file names and of course like I said the other time, good comments, very important. Your code should be scalable. You want to ensure that this code is something that can adapt to growing complexity and demands without sacrificing performance. So write tests, do automated tests, uh, let your variable names be meaningful. Of course, you want to store configuration data or configuration settings in a single config file so that edits are only done in that location, not you know, you're going to look for where you have this variable set and changing the value by hand each time and it's not scalable that way. So scalability is just one central location, one source of truth. Of course, modular design, uh, eases code uh, scalability and code things you need, not what you may need. And yeah, your GitHub repositories should be maintainable. You want to have somewhere where people can report issues. So your URL, your, the URL for your repository, typically for slash issues, people can go there, create a new issue, and you can follow through on these things. Uh, people should have a way to contribute to uh, your open source projects for sure by basically forking the repository and making proposed changes. They submit a pull request, you look through those, and then you're able to um, get all these um, changes being made. So your code should be robust and adaptable. I get the code reviewed. I'm glad the previous speaker talked extensively on code review, so I don't want to uh, overemphasize that. So embrace criticism and of course, keep refining the code. And, you know, of course it should be reliable, easy to test and update without, you know, easily breaking. Your code should perform as intended. So I do like to talk about automation a lot, but if your application is in the biomedical space, I would recommend using a workflow management system to implement your code. Otherwise, of course, there are different program programming languages you could choose depending on what suits your use case. So if you're interested in the life sciences and bioinformatics, these are some of the areas that you might want to consider, um, you know, transcriptomics, metagenomics, human genomic variation and things like that. So it's easy to kind of um, read about these things and find public data sets you could use to uh, practice uh, bioinformatics. All right, so this is pretty much my final slide, which is if you want to start writing good quality code for bioinformatics, which is what I advocate for, you could get uh, public data from the sequence read archive. These are repositories, sequence read archive, gene expression, omnibus, the ENA, RefSeq, GenBank, and do the type of analysis you like. As part of what the African Society for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology does, which is to advance bioinformatics in Africa, and of course, beyond Africa, you could check some of the projects and curatum projects that um, 
I have been able to facilitate in this URL. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Alatin. So uh, we have a few questions in the note. The first one is any example of good coding practices? Okay, example of good coding practices. Yes. Yeah, um, so the examples of good coding practice, well, I will just say that, um, I mean, it's very important to be able to get other people's inputs uh, from your work, uh, like reviewers, that's, that's already been talked about. Um, I will, if depending on the application, right? So if you are doing bioinformatics in your code, my recommendation is make your workflow reproducible by using a workflow engine like one of the ones I uh, mentioned. It could be Nextflow or SnakeMake or CWL or Widow. So reproducibility is very important because the reviewers sometimes are not very savvy with the Bash or Python, right? But if you implement your code in some of these uh, workflow engines, they can just run it without necessarily understanding the uh, underlying what's happening under the hood. So it's easy to regenerate your result and of course, uh, endorse your manuscript if they see that uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward than if they have a hard time understanding what you've done or trying to see if they can reproduce the result. So that would be one other thing. Uh, as much as possible, have a GitHub repository where your code lives. And even if you've decided to submit your, your work to some, um, maybe my, um, journal, for instance, they want to see uh, that the code lives somewhere and they can test uh, or run the code against some data set. So those will be some of the things that come to mind immediately. But the entire presentation is actually about practices anyway. Um, thank you very much, Alighton. The second question we have is when to decide whether to modularize the code or just run the code directly. Um, and then there is a complex RNA sequence pipeline versus simple tasks. So I'm not sure if that's the answer or that's part of the question. Yeah, so when to decide to modularize the code is if you realize that some of the functions or steps of your analysis will be used in some other, so maybe let's say that your entire analysis has a couple of, uh, your entire work or project has a couple of analysis types modularize your code if there are common steps across the analysis types. Generally, you want to do quality control and maybe you want to do some trimming regardless of what your data is, right? So you could have a module that just takes the two steps of uh, trimming, um, quality control of your reads as well as trimming. It's a module. You could apply that to both of the, uh, of the analysis that you're doing for your project. So those are uh, simple things, just combine. The idea is to combine functions or methods into one place that can be shared across um, across pipelines. Thank you very much, Alighton. Um, do we have any other question from everyone here? If you want to un unmute and ask the question directly. So I, there is, I think, a comment in the chat. Um, good coding involve, in, improves collaboration, debugging, and testing, while reducing long-term costs. Yes, that's very true, correct. Thanks for that addition. Um, yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. Next, we are going to have breakout room, which Pradeep will introduce. And um, there are still a few participants that have not yet um, selected their preference in terms of the breakout room. Kindly do that before we open the rooms. And I will let Pradeep introduce the breakout session and then I will open the rooms. Thank you, Tans. So our today's uh, breakout discussion topic would be bug in a scientific tool. So think about a bug you have encountered in a scientific tool either as a user or a writer of the code itself. And was this software code open? And if not, could openness have made any difference to this tool, whether the bug could have 
avoided if it was open source. So this would be the topic of the discussion. And uh, we would like to, you know, the directions for the written discussion rooms are each room will be assigned three, four members. So please agree if you want to use as this on a document directly, write on the document, Etherpad or Zoom chat. And each person could take 2.5 minutes to uh, write down their response. And the next five minutes, each uh, person go through the document and comment on each other's notes. So uh, please, once you go to the breakout room, please uh, uh, write your names and your comments in the uh, uh, chat etherpad so that once we, we are back, I hope we have time to discuss your uh, learnings from the breakout discussion. Uh, Taz, you are muted. I'm sorry about that. So in a moment, I'm going to create the breakout rooms. And the breakout rooms will be for 15 minutes. If you have any issues while in breakout room, please let us know. We'll come back and help you out. And yes. you will have a reminder before the breakout room surprisingly closes early. Yes, we have people already joining the breakout rooms. I did not assign any of the presenters to a breakout room. If you would like to be, please let me know. Um, so uh, let me wait until like everybody. Should we pause the Welcome back, everyone. Almost most of us are here, and some of our colleagues are still engaging in nice discussions. They will be back very soon. So, meanwhile, welcome back, everyone. Uh, please, uh, please try to write notes in the Etherpad after uh, once the session is over, once you have some time. So meanwhile, let's proceed to our next segment of today's cohort call, which is uh, the topic would be about package management. It would be uh, 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 delivered by uh, our speaker, invited speaker, Ruth Nanjala. So welcome Ruth Nanjala to uh, uh, speak on this topic, package management. Please uh, help uh, us uh, with the how to do package management and the principles. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, as you've been told, I'm Nanjala Ruth. I am based of Oxford. I'm doing my PhD here, but I'm also part of the Carpentries community. I'm a certified Carpentries instructor, and I'm also part of the Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya. And also, uh, I sort of like uh, co-founded my science journey as just a platform for uh, science storytelling. So today I'll be speaking about package management and uh, for the context of, you know, your software environment and how do you uh, ensure that you have reproducibility in, in your research. So um, I like to start with uh, the analogy that if you think about, I don't know whether some of you have done hiking or like I, uh, probably you've heard about hiking. So if you think about, you know, the idea of exploring in uncharted mountain ranges, you probably need, you know, a few things um, in before you actually go for the actual hiking. So you'd need a portable tent, you'd need, you know, uh, a, a few personal items, et cetera, et cetera before getting on to the trip. So if you think about your own project, it could be in data science or uh, whatever uh, field you're in. So if you think about your own project, you want to ensure that you create an environment where at the end of your research, you can be able to reproduce 
the work that you have done. And this is where creating software environments come in play. So before you kickstart your whole entire research and, tr and start running things, you have to ensure that the environment for it to be actually reproducible, you know, in the next one week, two months, and, and one year uh, has been created. So then it's important for you to evaluate what, uh, what kind of environment can I use? How do I ensure that I have reproducibility of my code afterwards, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what you are going to be talking about today. And if you think about installing tools, I don't know if you have had experiences of installing tools uh, um, on, on your uh, different uh, operating systems. So like you have uh, Windows, you have Linux, then you have Mac OS. So you, you, you've probably used uh, all, of, all of the OS or maybe one of them. But if you think about inst installing tools in this uh, particular um, environments, it's usually a bit complicated, um, especially because um, most tools don't make it to app to yam uh, if you're using a linux environment you can easily install tools using app to yam but if you think about most tools they don't get to that so you can't install them with app yam or even pipe so if you're trying to ensure that you get an environment that can work with all of your tools and that you can actually reproduce code it means you have to create an environment where you can use everything whether it's installable using app pipe or something else so yeah, this is just a pie chart that shows the complexity of trying to install tools and automation and things like that. And this is just like a graph that shows the dependency help and why it's important for you to actually have an environment that will ensure that, you know, if someone is going to use your software, they can actually reproduce the kind of results that you got. Or even yourself, you know, sometimes we say, you know, my code was working, but now I don't know what happened to the code. You know, it's like it's no longer working and I can't explain why my code isn't working. So if you have an environment that you've created and it's working right now, it means that if you come back after one week, after one month, you will not have the, you know, the thing where you say, I don't know what happened to my code. I don't understand why it's working. Right. So we have different package managers that help help us with that. And a package manager just helps with the, inst uh, you know, handle handling installations and dependencies. It allows for multiple independent environments. So, you know, if you want to work on this environment and this other environment, you can create different sort of like software environments. You can easily configure and also, you know, uh, I'm gonna send you these slides, but basically package managers sort of like just try to ease your work with, you know, working with different um, uh, uh, softwares and installing different softwares into sort of like one or different environments that can be reproduced at the end of the day. And also the good thing about package managers is that they're usually isolated from the operating system. So it means that they are not tied to your Windows, your, your Linux. It means they can be carried from one operating system to another one. So that's uh, why you need to use a package a package manager. So uh, there are a few package managers that are available. I'm not sure if you've heard of any of these um, uh, managers, uh, package managers, but there is Docker, there is uh, Singularity, and then there is Conda and Balconda. So if you think about a package manager, it's just like, you know, you think, think about a container. So like, for example, this is my container here or my bottle here. If I didn't have this bottle, it means I, I, I'm not able to carry the water that is inside this bottle. So in the same way, if you're thinking about creating a, a software environment, it means you need to first come up or uh, you know find a bottle that you'll be able to put all your sort of like uh, um, tools inside. And then you have one bottle that has everything in it. So for example, I have this one, uh, one bottle it has the water that I require to drink, you know, during the day. So in the same way, you have one bottle, which is a container. And this container, you've installed all the tools that you need. So for example, if you need some tools, if you need, uh, you know, R, if you need like um, PAL, if you like any tool that you can think of, whether it's in C, PAL, Bash, whatever, you can install all of them in this one bottle. And then if you want to use the environment, it means you just have to open the bottle, take out the contents, and then you get all the, 
you know, software that you need. And then afterwards you can close back your bottle. So it's just, it, they just work in the same way. So you package everything in one place and then the place is isolated. Then if every time you need to use it, you just come back and open the container, then use that particular and, you know, get the context, the contents of your bottle. So uh, I've mentioned that there are, uh, you know, this sort of like, con oh, there's a question. Can I finish the presentation before the question? <laughs> yes, please. For sure, for sure. Okay, thank you. So um, I've mentioned that there's these different types of, uh, you know, containers or package managers. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, highlight each of them individually so you can you get to understand the advantage and disadvantage of each of them. So one is Conda, um, and uh, Conda is one of the widely used, uh, you know, package manager because it's very easy to to use and to manipulate. As I've mentioned, they're usually independent of the operating system and the programming language, meaning that they are not tied to, you know, Python, R, blah blah blah. You can use it anywhere, and it's also not tied to the operating system, so you can use it on any operating system. And as I've mentioned, it's also very easy to install. And then no, no root access. It means that, you know, when it, sometimes you're installing tools, if you're installing on your own um, personal machine, you usually require sudo password. So if you're using apt, it will tell you, uh, you, you, you can only install using like sudo install um, something like maybe sudo install Python or sudo install some tools. Um, Sorry, sudo app install, blah, blah, blah. So you need the sudo access. But then if you think about working on a cloud server or working in a, you know, a cluster environment where you do not have root access, it means that you cannot install your tools using app to yam or whatever. But if you have Conda, it means that you can install your tools because it does not require root access. So meaning it doesn't require a sudo password. And then there is Docker. Uh, Docker is just a platform that is used to build and run applications in isolated containers, and it also helps with reproducibility. I won't repeat that. So the difference is that the difference between Conda and Docker is that Docker uses images to run containers. So that, this might sound a bit, you know, a lot to process in, in this one session, but um, basically you need to create or to build an image before you you run your docker container meaning you just need to create uh you know like um like i have mentioned a bottle and then have all your tools installed in that image then convert that image into a container it's very easy to learn how to do this uh, it's not complicated but yeah that is how it uh, it works the only difference is that this one you require you are required to build an image before you get your container but with conda it's very easy fast fast you can you get your all your tools in one place so you can easily use uh, images that are on third party registries so third party registries are things like docker hub or Quay Hub. These are things that you can just Google online, and then you you go and, and look at all the images that they have, and uh, you know some of them could be images that you can use. Um, so images is just something that contains tools, right? So this could be something that could be applicable for your own research. So you don't need to create a whole new image. You can just download that one that has already been created for you, and then use it to get your container. So like I've mentioned, there's Docker Hub and then there's Quay uh, registry. So you can check out any of this. So the difference with Docker is that um, like most virtualization platforms, um, it's sort of like, I don't know whether you've heard about VirtualBox box and, and, and uh, VMware. Um, so the advantage of Docker is that, like I had said, it's independent of the uh, of the machine, so it doesn't replicate your hardware, right? Um, so it's it's a very lightweight, meaning it it doesn't take much of your space. So that's the advantage of using a Docker as opposed to using a virtual machine. So maybe some of you have used VirtualBox and you've been told you cannot, you know, you need this amount of memory, you need this amount of capacity for you to be able to run a virtual box. But if you're using Docker, then you don't require, it's not resource heavy. You don't require a lot of resources. 
So then there is singularity. So remember I mentioned there is Konda, there is Docker, and then there's singularity. So these are three uh, package managers. So singularity is actually very similar to Docker if you look at it from a user's perspective, but the only difference is how it's, you know, sort of like design or the algorithm behind it in the architecture, uh, sorry, in the architecture of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the code. So if you're working on your own personal machine, you can easily run Docker, right? But if you're working on a cloud cluster or like a, a, a cloud server or a high, uh, a high performance computing, they are restricted to only use singularity. So this is because singularity is more secure. So the security can be you know, tested and it can be tra uh, tracked as opposed to Docker. So most uh, cloud servers only operate, actually not most, all of them uh, operate with singularity only. But if you're not working on a cluster, then you can work with Docker. But basically Docker and singularity are sort of like very similar uh, to each other. Also, you can use um, a singularity container to run a Docker image, but that's also another just, um, sorry, just one moment. Yeah, so you can use a singularity uh, to run a Docker image on your cluster, but that's something else that if you're interested in learning, I can share the materials later on, yeah. So like I've mentioned, uh, the advantage of singularity is that, you know, there is verifiable security uh, because it uses cryptographic signatures. And then the other thing is that it, it also make, easily makes use of GPUs and high speed networks compared to um, Docker. And that's why most, um, actually not most, all cloud servers use uh, singularity. So yeah. Uh, these are further you know, resources on each of the two, uh, three package managers that I have mentioned, Docker, sorry, Docker, Conda and Singularity. So you can check them out. And if you have a question, you know, even after this session, I am happy to answer them and to sort of like help you understand them uh, because I've been able to work with all the three package managers and uh, sort of like uh, able to identify issues which it, with each and every one of them. Yeah, so I think that's all the presentation I had. So now I can take questions uh, from you guys. Thank you, Ruth. So any questions for Ruth in the chat or in the etherpad? So we have one comment, love yeah. the bottle analogy. And then uh, also thanks for the presentation. Any preference among the platforms from the user's perspective? When yeah. Konda, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Right. Uh, so any preferences among the platforms? So yeah, I would say if you are a beginner, Konda is the very like is the easiest package manager to use. Honestly, so if you don't, you know, if you don't have a lot of time to learn Docker and Singularity you can easily jump and you know kickstart on with with the uh, conda so that's easy to learn because you just need to sort of like do install conda mini conda and then do do conda install whatever so you can create a whole environment but that's easy to follow the advantage of using docker and singularity is that docker and singularity like i had mentioned uh, they use images so these images are stored on registries so there is a singularity registry is called singularity hub i think uh, so there's a singularity registry and then there's a docker hub for docker and then there's a query registry that stores both docker and singularity uh, images so the advantage of uh, of docker and singularity over conda is that after one year after two years uh you can easily you know access everything because it's online and it's publicly available you can easily just go online and download the image and run it on any machine right so Conda, unless you've stored your Conda environment somewhere on your machine, which potentially might, you know, something might happen to it, or I mean, you know, things happen to computers, <laughs> I don't wanna mention, but yeah, uh, the thing is that uh, you, need, you need a place to store your environment. So you could put it on GitHub, 
if you have it on GitHub, that's uh that's okay. You can easily just get the environment from GitHub and 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 get it back. But the thing about Conda is that sometimes it it sort of like collides with the uh the base environment that you've created. So even if you create a whole new environment, sometimes they clash together and you get all these kind of errors that sometimes are very difficult and hard to process and solve. You can resolve them, but it's just tough. So the advantage of Docker and Singularity is once you've created uh, an image and you run it in a container, it sort of like runs very separately from everything. So it's not tied to your operating system. So it means even after 10 years, and they've updated my Python, maybe now it's no longer Python 3, it's Python 10. If I just use the same container and my, my research was running on Python 3, I can still run it on, on that sort of like container. Does that make sense? So it's Conda is easy uh, to use initially. Docker and Singularity require a bit of time to learn, but at the end of it, like compared, like comparing the three of them long-term, it's uh it's uh it makes more sense to use Docker and Singularity because because you can easily just uh you know get back your original uh, uh environment that doesn't have complications with your base environment. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, Mata, sorry, I hope I'm not from No worries. Me. Thank you so much. I guess I have a a kind of thank you for the great presentation. I have a strategy kind of question. Because we've been working on a code, my code is mostly C++ based. So yeah. we've developed certain uh, also Docker to keep all the dependencies and versions. But since yeah. every time when I need to change the source, you know, I have to go to the source and then create a new image for the new Docker version. So in terms of maintaining all of that, um, what would be your advice, you know, whether one for that source code part that a developer usually needs to manipulate yeah. and then for let's like, say a docker version um yeah. that kind of keeps it together yeah so my advice would be if your software environment or if your research is still so for example let's say i was using python 3 right initially and my uh sort of like my research is still or whatever code i was running is still tied on python 3 the easiest way to ensure that you don't have to keep updating the the thing is to have your image stored on a registry. So get your, uh, push your, your image to either a Quay or Docker Hub. And then anytime you need to use it or anytime anyone needs to use it, they don't need to use any other Python version. They can just simply use the Python version that you installed in your Docker image. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think there was a second part to the question. Maybe I missed it. Was it with the matter? I think. Which one? Sorry. I don't know whether I answered both questions at once or like they were sort of like separate. Okay. It was good. It was good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It, uh, image registry. This is what I got out of that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Mata. Discusses for um, pushing uh your image to a registry to the docker hub or quay you have to go through github but it should be publicly available to to access yeah thank you ruth for generously answering all the questions uh i know some people like me have too much uh, from this session so we'll come back to the notes and recording and mark uh, reach out to you for further questions so now I'll pass it on to Taz for closing part of the session. Thank, um, you. thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you also, Pradeep. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today's session. If you look at the notes, we have a an assessment, not assessment, actually a survey to understand how you are faring along with the cohort in general. So if you will take some time after this call to answer, I'm also going to follow up that with an email so that we have more visibility for those that were unable to join us today. But with that, I would close the call and say thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm.